and kind of um, very briefly give you what I was thinking about this show. Um, I had been thinking a lot with an automobile show that I was doing about drawing and how drawing and um, drawing can help you learn and that artists keep sketchbooks the way writers might keep a journal. So I was looking at the connectedness of writing and drawing, basically. And uh, so I was thinking about that as a theme for this show and in discussing that with Susan Hagen, um, Susan said, oh, I've got just the person to curate a show. You should get in touch with Gerard Brown. And so I did, and Gerard took the idea and really ran with it. And um, so now it's, he's got to explain what he did. <laughs> so, no problem. Uh, right, no problem. Um, and so I get to introduce Gerard. There he is. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Fran. Um, and I want to thank all the artists who are involved in the show for the uh, uh, enormous amount of time and, and talent you put into it. Um, so thanks all for coming. Um, for me, when I do a show, it's always an argument with myself half the time. But it's always an argument, and it always proceeds from some assumption. And so this argument was kind of with an understanding of contemporary art um, that's been going on, you know, that, that I've grown up looking at. Um, Art that involves writing, art that involves text. And it is specifically that idea of text that is very common in the art world these days. Text, that kind of unnameable verbiage that you know you're not supposed to read when you're standing in an art gallery because you're standing. And the fact that I'm a writer by trade as well as a painter and that I'm interested in things that you actually do read and the importance of reading and the importance of writing um, to contemporary art. Um, so I wanted to have this, sh this show, which was kind of a, uh, my, my personal argument. I wanted to organize a show, my personal argument against a lot of art in the 1960s about, you know, like Mel Bachner's work and Saul Lewitt's work and Lawrence Wexler's work, where the, this, this writing had this kind of presence in the space and was resistant to your involvement in it. I wanted writing, I wanted writing in this show. I wanted not, uh, I wanted reading in this show. I didn't want text. Um, partly because I think that that kind of work is very seductive and very interesting because those artists were attracted to the idea of, of language as a structure for visual experience. And that's something that just completely sucks me in. But then to take away all of the meaning that is built, layered onto that structure seems like a horrible thing. The second argument that the show was trying to make was about, it was about this idea of the importance of writing. And trying to, at least in my mind, and hopefully in the minds of people who um, come and see the show, something I saw in the work of all the artists, was trying to connect the act of writing, the physical act of inscription, with the art, with the act of making drawings, making prints, making sculpture, making paintings, making work in textiles. And also to try and find some place where the um, overlap between seeing and reading could be explored because those things are very often presented as two kind of alternatives, when I think that the more interesting relationships between seeing and reading are the ones where one contains the other in a sort of Venn diagram, you know? That somehow we go from seeing things in an art gallery to suddenly reading them in a gallery. And I find that to be a really exciting moment. So I wanted to find work that was about that. So I needed to put together a show that um, invited welcoming artists who were um, de-emphasizing the formal properties of text in favor of um, ideas about story, ideas about narrative, um, and also um, that promoted this notion that I think was first put forward by, at least to my knowledge, by Leo Steinberg, that the eye is a part of the mind. And that when you engage with language, when you engage with reading, you're activating other parts of your brain as well. And so um, the idea that you would how, that there's a relationship between seeing and reading and hearing or speaking. Um, and so suddenly many, many senses and many, many kinds of, of, of activity are all involved at one time. Um, so to that end, it seems like it's really kind of appropriate, you know, as we look for this idea of like the show being a web of different human responses to seeing that engage your mind in a number of ways, to, um, to address this argument, this idea of a thesis, you know, those are, any students here? Are there any students here? Please, God, let there be students here. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Right. So they teach you in your writing class, right? You have a thesis, right? You're supposed to support it, right? 
you're also supposed to kind of test it. <laughs> so you, you want to put in things that don't, that, that challenge that thesis, that try to really te road test it. So, um, so I wanted to put it together a show that, that attempted to prove, but also attempted to question these things I've been talking about, about the role of writing and speaking and, and reading. So it seemed a good place to start with this thing about other senses. And so when Fran asked me to do the show, um, it, one of the first things that came to mind was uh, the work of Sharma you know, which I had seen in Exhibition Scout, which very tiny, come closer, I won't bite. Okay. <laughs> Okay. which I had seen at, uh, in, in her exhibition at Gallery Joe in Philadelphia. I don't know if you're familiar with that space. Really wonderful space that supports predominantly drawn. So these are drawings, drawings by Charlotte Highland of uh, passages from literature. Um, from, she works uh, with text from uh, authors like Proust or Nabokov. This is a, a passage from Henry James. Um, and I was really interested in the way that you would spend, you kind of can't not get sucked into these drawings to some extent. And when you do, you find yourself envisioning in your mind's eye the settings that are being described. She's chosen texts which are rich with visual imagery, which um, promote a sense of, of, of the space you're occupying, and all this is happening through the medium of language. So your, 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 imagine, your spatial imagination, your haptic senses are being awakened by written language in this. Which interests me a great deal, and sort of takes me to the work of Martha Rich to some extent. Because when I first saw these, I found it impossible not to say them. You know? I defy people not to say these, at least in your mind. You know? When you're looking at the cooling crystals. You know? That they have a kind of, um, you know, voice to them, which results from the shape of the, pat of the panels, from the way the typography is made, to the, the arrangement of them in this kind of big cloud of conversation, sort of activates your sense of hearing and your sense of speech as you're looking, okay? Um, which also to me, you know, reminds me of work right outside, uh, work by Rebecca Targ and her collaborators um, on video. Here they are challenging how we understand how our memory works, how reading and speaking connect to one another in this video. The actress has been given a script, asked to memorize it uh, in a very short period of time, and then to perform it. And so we see how writing begins to exert pressure on our speech, that writing is a kind of like idealized form of language and shapes our use of language to some extent. Um, and then we kind of fail to live up to the prompt to what writing can do. We don't speak in paragraphs. Sometimes we don't even speak in complete or sensical sentences, and I promise you I'll probably do that if I haven't already. So one component of the show dealt with this question of activating senses through reading. I also wanted to think more you know, pragmatically about reading and how artists who are frequently described as nonverbal or self-described as nonverbal people use reading to fertilize their work, to generate ideas for their work. So Sue White's work came to mind when I was thinking about this, because Sue has a long involvement in the history of books and book making. Um, and her work had uh, this sort of reef of work, of barnacle-like structures that she's uh, exhibited here, which has grown, if I understand correctly, grown a little bit from earlier manifestations of this, you know, is drawn from texts that we can kind of glimpse reading of, but which is almost as much read for its density of print as for what it actually says. And uh, earlier, some of you may have been at the lecture where she was talking about how she arranges some of them to um, make short, almost poetic phrases. In them. So I invite you to take a closer look. Um, another reader, another artist whose work comes largely out of reading in this show is Matthew Sibieli, whose readings in poetry um, inform these objects. And I was really interested in, in inviting Matt to do this when I saw these pants. Because you know, here he's trying to convince me that the pair of pants, the black pair of pants on the on, on our left, is a translation of a poem by, by Pablo Neruda. I'm not quite sure I believe it, but I like the idea because it works just like a text message. LMAO, you know, uh, the, this idea of using first letters as abbreviations for whole words. So the translation of the text that he's using is the first letter of each word in the poem in that stanza. 
and it becomes something else, something, well, you know, maybe not said in polite company. Another reader in the show is Cheryl Ribnauer, and Cheryl is to me one of the most, she was one of the people who also came to mind very early in this show, because I went to grad school with Cheryl a number of years ago, bigger than probably I should talk about. Anyway. <laughs> Which is school of Cheryl, she's a poet and a reader, and she was very interested in uh, Lynn Paginian's book, My Life. Has anybody read this? Paginian's a language poet, and she uses systems to generate her poetry. And in this book, which is it, it's about 30, 30, almost 40 chapters long, each one chapter standing for each part of her life, there's a, a, a gradual accretion of meaning because it starts in almost nonsense. But these phrases pile up through repetition and become more and more meaningful. And Cheryl has charted each one's occurrence and appearance. So we get this kind of arc of the book on this enormous spreadsheet of how she's read the book, a guide to an almost unreadable poem. Um, she becomes sort of this perfect reader for us. Um, the act of writing, you know, is, is the other side of this question. It's R. W. reading, writing. And so, you know, I've, I've of course thought of, of uh, Martha McDonald, whose work, uh, whose practice includes writing every day. And she writes, uh, she begins every day writing three pages of automatic writing, which finds its, its way into her performances and work. And this work actually is a, an application of writing to extend a performance into another, into another media. This was performed originally at, at Bartram's Gardens um, as a, a monologue performance, um, and then turned into these um, embroideries, which were subsequently included in, this artist, in an artist book, which you can pick up this evening if you like. I'd be happy to, to show you those. Um, writing is incredibly different from language in some ways, and, and I wanted to include some work that helped us think about that, so Marianne Davis work came to mind for that reason, because she's playing with a number of things which help us understand writing, you know, uh, help us know when to breathe, help us know where to lay emphasis, but very little of it is actually writing, you know. Um, I was really taken with the, the sort of quality of punctuation. And also Aubrey Costello's writing in this graffiti manner, but with an extremely interesting gender bit to it, caught my attention. So, um, so I wanted to hope the show gives you guys an opportunity to reflect on the various roles that artists are now occupying in society. <coughs> where we used to have kind of a, 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 a pretty simple job to make pictures or make objects to think about. Now uh, artists are our authors, our editors, our readers, our scholars, our increasingly our researchers. And, um, and I, I, I hope that's something that you can um, look at the show with. And um, I hope you get a chance to talk to the artists. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. Introduce the artists. I would be happy to. So uh, we'll just go around the room. Uh, Sue White, whose work is over there. Martha Rich, whose work is over there. Sharka Highland couldn't be with us this evening. Aubrey Costello. Or Aubrey? Are you <laughs> there we go, Aubrey. Marianne Dage. Cheryl Rittenauer is in Chicago and couldn't be here. Martha McDonald. And uh, Rebecca Tark is also in, uh, is in Wisconsin, not in Wisconsin. So. Okay. So please, now that you know who they are, talk to them.